extensively normally, not in lockdown times. Um, it's one of the perks of the job. Uh, in fact, I think I'm on 60, just under 60 countries now. Um, and I try and get at least a couple of new ones every year. Unfortunately, lockdown caused me to miss out on a round the world trip. Um, let me come back one. Caused, caused me to miss out on a round the world trip on a private jet for a month. Um, I was I was due to start in Seattle and then fly to Japan, China, the Philippines, Borneo, uh, India, Rwanda, Madagascar, Kenya, and then back to the US uh, on a private jet, all for wildlife. It was like the ultimate wildlife safari. Uh, and five days before I was due to get on the plane, it got cancelled because of coronavirus. Um, that was most annoying. Uh, other than that, as I said, I'm a, a, a brand ambassador. I'm a brand ambassador for a variety of brands, not Canon. Everyone thinks I am, uh, but I'm not. Uh, I just do more work for Canon than their, all of their ambassadors combined. Um, I am a brand, global brand ambassador for SanDisk and G Technology, uh, ISO light panels, Manfrotto, Lasterlite, um, unofficially Lee filters because they don't really have ambassadors, uh, and a printing lab called Koi Lab that you would never have heard of. Um, so I, I get to play with a lot of cool kit, um, and that's part of why I love the variety of photographing a lot of different subjects, uh, because it, um, it gives me lots of different projects to try lots of different things. Fundamentally, I'd, I'd get very, very bored um, if I had to do the same thing every day. Um, and, uh, and so I try and mix it up as much as possible. A little dot map um, of, of places I've been. Um, it could also be places I want to go back to. Uh, the common question I get is, what's your favourite place? Uh, if you could only go to one other place, what's your favourite? And uh, my answer is, there is no favourite. Um, I love them all for different reasons. The one I would recommend you all go to if you've not been uh, is over on the right-hand side of that map, which is Taiwan. Anyone been to Taiwan? No. <laughs> no? No, see, uh, over here in the West, we don't really think of Taiwan other than it used to make a lot of stuff. Um, but actually, it's a beautiful little country. It's very tiny. Um, I spent a month driving around Taiwan, um, hired a car and drove around for a commission, actually, um, and highly recommended. Very, very uh, varied. Um, wouldn't say it was my favourite, though. So let's go on with some pictures because that's what you're most interested in. Uh, now you know who I am. So uh, I shoot a lot of landscapes, um, things like this. This is Death Valley. Um, and for me, um, photography is all about the light. I don't equally have a favorite subject. Uh, I have an enjoyment for taking pictures and the technical challenge of taking pictures. Uh, I've always described myself as being uh, technically capable, creatively inept, um, which, which, you know, that feels very much like it, it, it describes me. Um, so I, I always approach things uh, from a technical perspective, I guess, um, in much the same way that a carpenter approaches every problem with a hammer. Um, uh, I, I see everything as having a, a technical solution uh, and the creativity comes occasionally later, mostly never. Um, I like responding to what I see. So this is Death Valley. Uh, in the US, uh, fabulous place to go and shoot. Again, a bit like Taiwan, incredibly varied, um, but uh, but uh, different in that it's so huge and open. Uh, and they speak English, mostly, sort of a, a version of, you know, it is America after all. Um, I also like cityscapes. This is, in fact, Taiwan. That was the, it was the tallest building in the world. It's now the second or third tallest building in the world. Uh, it's called um, Taipei 101. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you a little later on about finding locations, because this was uh, one such uh, uh, occurrence of finding a location. And it's a very important skill that you have to develop uh, if you want to photograph um, landscapes and architecture and cityscapes, particularly. Uh, otherwise, you end up with the same pictures as everyone else. Um, there's also a bit of action sport. Uh, and I'm a big fan of flash. Um, in the sense that I use a lot of speed light flash. Um, people think that this is photoshopped. I, I have a, uh, a saying for my pictures that I use in-camera Photoshop because I do very little post-processing. Um, it's normally limited to removing some dust spots uh, and a little bit of sharpening. Uh, I like to get things as right as I possibly can in-camera. 
Um, I know that is uh, occasionally a controversial view when followed up by, I think that's the true essence of photography. Um, <laughs> who's thrown something at their computer? <laughs> uh, definite split opinion, though, I think, on that one. <laughs> yes. I, I, I'm not surprised. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I'm very much about getting it right in camera. I think um, fundamentally, I guess I'm just lazy when it comes to the computer. I can do all the processing. I'd just rather be out with a camera in my hand than sitting at a computer, um, spending hours processing an image or indeed rescuing an image I got wrong. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm very much more about the photography, the camera technique side of things. So this is uh, a complete lunatic, uh, as I like to call him. His name's Andre. He's one of the top 10 trials bike riders in the world. Um, and this is in Devon. I was filming a little piece about him uh, and doing some stills. And we went down to this beach and I saw the rock stacks and I said, do you think you could jump between them? <laughs> <laughs> and he went, that's why people like me keep a job. <laughs> <laughs> Just the ambulance. <laughs> yeah, he, he looked at me and went, yeah. I was like, you sure? He went, yeah, of course I can. So it's like 30 foot up, mate. It's death if you don't make it, but that'd be fine. Totally fine. Okay. Um, so up he went. Actually, the, the stack on the right-hand side, he, he rode his bike up the back of it because it's kind of a little bit of a slope. Um, well, more of a lot of a slope. He kind of bunny hopped sideways up it, to be fair. Um, carried his bike over one way and then just proceeded to jump back the other way repeatedly. Um <laughs> Lit with flash. Now, in this case, obviously, I, you know, I see that great sky. I think, oh, that sky is going to be amazing. Uh, but I don't want him to be a silhouette. Uh, although, actually, the silhouette version of this is quite nice. Um, I kind of want him to pop out. He was wearing that very bright, vibrant blue top. So I've used flash to fill him in, to, to lift him out against that background. Uh, and it's all done with speed light flash. So, so your little speed light flash guns. I'm looking around for one because I know there's one near here somewhere and I just can't quite see it. Um, it's not big studio flash. I think speed light flash, if you understand it and know how to work with it, is an incredibly capable tool. Uh, and I find people, um, when, when I talk about flash, uh, I find people fall into uh, one of two camps. They're either the I love flash or I'm an ambient light only photographer. And what I've learned over the years is that I'm an ambient light only photographer translates as I have no idea how to use flash. <laughs> Um, it's actually not that complex. It's really not a complex thing to get your head around and it pays dividends to actually take the time because fundamentally photography is all about light. It's painting or drawing with light. Uh, and if you are not sculpting light correctly, then you're not making the most of every photo opportunity that presents itself to you. Where was the flash in that shot though? Uh, where was the flash in that shot? So they, uh, there were there were four flash guns ganged into one, uh, wow. and they were just slightly camera right of me uh, firing. They were all zoomed in to 105 mil. Uh, they were 600 EXs, so they effectively acted as a single beam of light, um, just about a couple of meters in front of me and to the right. Ah, right. Uh, and with that, it looks like it's one minute to eight. It is. Yes, time for a clap. For a clap, not the yeah. clap. <laughs> I'll see you in a minute. Back in a few minutes.
Has he been on the phone works of him, Matt? Where are they getting all the forward? Of rustling going on. <laughs> I can see your, some of your contacts there, Chris. Yeah. Who's sexy Susie? Oh, I'll give you a number. All right. You on the sherry, Heather? <laughs> no, um, what you, uh, gingerbread gin. It's my Christmas night treat. I want to know. I want to know how you get on that four. Those four that we can see. Melchior. It's Skype. I was watching when it, I think it's whoever you've spoke, whoever's spoken. It's sort of like had a priority thing going. I'm not quite sure what how it works. Cheers. You weren't on last night, were you, Chris, with uh, Loughton? No, I briefly came on for about two seconds, but you can't. You can't run two video conferencing systems at the same time. No, but it was it was amazing having uh, twenty five people on the screen. Yeah, yeah, it worked really well. Right, everybody back. Yep. Yes. Back. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Turn off me mooty thing. All right. All back to you then, Dave. Is it me or is Dave? Is it frozen? Oh, I, can, I can hear you, Chris. No, I can hear it. you, Chris, but it's frozen. No, it's, I think it's, it's, it's back now. I think. Yeah, you. David's avatar's moving about now. He's just. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Oh, good, good, <laughs> fabulous. Is everyone <laughs> back? Shout if you're not here. <laughs> We believe they're back. Okay, we believe everyone's back. Fabulous. Good clapping, everyone. Uh, I hope I didn't deafen anyone that could still hear me because I took a saucepan and a wooden spoon. Uh, uh, okay, behind, right. House <laughs> behind us let off about three tonne of fireworks. Nice. Good. Right. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Fabulous. That means everything's still working. After it did indeed freeze. OK, so where were we? Uh, I was talking about flash and I was talking about uh, painting or drawing with light. Uh, and if you're not using flash, I think um, you're missing out on a lot of photo opportunities. OK, moving on. Um, sometimes I fly drones um, and occasionally, well, once I sailed across the Atlantic, that was last year. So this is a still from that. Uh, it's just to give you a, a bit of variety and, and kind of highlight the fact that I like to do a bit of everything. Um, in fact, this is the yacht I sailed across the Atlantic on. Uh, that is just coming into the Gibraltar Straits. Um, uh, I highly recommend any sailors here, highly recommend sailing across the Atlantic as a great way to pass time. Um, 
and also a great place to propose to your girlfriend because she's guaranteed to say yes uh, <laughs> because it was a bloody long swim if she said no um so uh yes that was uh, that was sometime last year so a bit of drone a uh, bit of aerial uh, content uh, and some wildlife so uh, i host uh, a whale watching tour in the sea of cortez in mexico um, i didn't i didn't this year because i was supposed to be going around the world um which obviously then got cancelled but normally I, I take a group down to the sea of cortez uh, and we go and photograph whales such as this humpback whale um, we actually go looking for blue whales more commonly um photographing whales like this one of the uh, hardest things to do you'd think it'd be quite easy because they're big and slow moving they're surprisingly not slow moving when they come out of the water um and you also don't know where they're coming they just appear randomly all of a pop out of the water uh, and it's for pictures like this where um the other tip i have about photography i guess is that you should know how to use your camera you shouldn't have to spend time looking at the settings uh figuring out where the buttons are uh, or how to make it do what you want it to do you should be able to do it instinctively because uh, because when a whale pops out the water it comes out the water and it's gone about a second later um, and if you want to get that shot, you need to turn and shoot and know exactly where everything is. Uh, so in this period of lockdown, spend time learning your camera. If you haven't already done so, put the camera to your eye. Um, try and change all of the key settings without taking the camera away from your eye, um, such that when you're presented with fleeting opportunities, you can make the most of them. Um, also shoot some street. Um, and I'll talk about all of these in a lot more detail as we go on. This is just kind of an overview. Uh, I shoot street. So this was um, a bit like the uh, a bit like the whale picture, I guess. It was a fleeting moment. It's in New Orleans. Uh, I was walking along one evening uh, with a camera on my own. Some people would suggest that's a stupid thing to do in New Orleans. Um, what was more stupid was setting a tripod up in the middle of the road um, as some drunk people questioned me about it. Um, they looked like they wanted my camera. <laughs> I didn't get my camera. Um, uh, so this, I was walking down the street. I, I saw this. Being able to see light is so crucial. I, I turned and I, I saw this and the light was just so cinematic. Uh, I took one frame as the lady was brushing the step, turned and carried on walking. Uh, and it's about those captured moments that, uh, that I find really interesting in, in street photography. Uh, and occasionally there's some portraits or fashion, uh, as this is. Uh, this is in uh, the deserts in a country where I probably shouldn't have had a model wearing very little. Um, so I won't tell you where it was, um, but you can probably guess. Uh, and uh, this was a, this was a fashion shoot um, for uh, for a, a brand that, um, that well they they said, can you do a shoot in the desert? Frankly, and I said yes, why not? Um, so it was tagged on to a, a trip while I was out there doing some or giving some workshops at another event. Uh, so portraits um, and then we're back to landscapes. So let's talk about landscapes in a little bit more detail. So photographing landscapes. Uh, how many of you shoot landscapes? Say aye. 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 Oh, oh, yeah. Okay, quite a lot of people shoot landscapes. I think landscapes are one of the most popular things to photograph because they don't go anywhere. Um, and if you if you want to be good at photographing landscapes, uh, there are a few things that you need uh, to pay attention to. One, um, I mentioned that location finding uh, or location scouting, being able to find good viewpoints. Uh, in this case, this is a place called Zabriskie Point in Death Valley. Uh, it's an incredibly easy viewpoint to find uh, because there's a car park just beside it. Um, it it's, it's not a super challenging uh, place to get to. Um, but you also, as you know, have to get up pretty early or stay up pretty late, particularly, um, particularly in the summer. Um, and then it's about waiting for the light and no two days will ever be, excuse me, will ever be the same. I actually uh, spent uh, four nights sleeping in a car in this area, coming back to this location every morning, uh, waiting for the light and for the three days, it was terrible. Uh, and on the fourth day, I got some really quite nice light. Um, and that's where perseverance comes in. 
the 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 pig-headedness or the doggedness to keep revisiting the same place because you know there's a great picture there uh, you just need to wait for the light to play ball uh, so perseverance i think is key i also think that uh, filters are uh, really essential in landscape photography so i said that i prefer to get it right in camera that includes using filters so i'm a big fan of nd grad filters um, and occasionally a polarizer uh, and any of the stoppers so uh, for long exposure type work uh, I don't go in for any of the coral grads or sunset grads or, or any of the colour adjustments. Um, uh, uh, no starburst filters either. Um, uh, not to say uh, they don't have a place. I just uh, they just don't work for me. I don't I don't feel that they suit the way I want to take pictures. But ND grads certainly uh, allow you to capture scenes that you otherwise couldn't without going down the realms of. Uh, HDR, um, which is a uh, horrible dynamic range photography, as I like to call it. <laughs> uh, again, another controversial view. Chris did warn you I'd be controversial, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, yes, filters. Okay, next up. Um, if you're going to find a location, try and try and make it a good one. This is um, the Chamonix Valley. It's above Mont Blanc. In fact, Mont Blanc is over on the right hand side of the picture. Uh, as you're looking at it, it's kind of that high peak on the right. Uh, this is a place called Lac Blanc. And I'm a big fan of reflections. I love a good reflection. Uh, I'm an absolute sucker for it. Uh, to the point that there were several people around this lake and there was one child throwing stones into it. And I asked them politely to stop. Um, and when they threw another stone in, I asked them less politely to stop. Uh, and when they threw another stone in, I shouted at them. Um, just because if you're going to find a nice reflection, you may as well get a great picture of it. I, I made up for it, though. I emailed them a copy of the picture afterwards and showed them why it was worth their while not throwing stones. Um, or I emailed their parents, at least. Uh, so I, I also think from a landscape perspective, um, composition obviously is key. Uh, I'm a big fan of foreground interest. Uh, I was giving a giving a workshop in the Middle East in uh, in one of the UAE states called Sharjah, and I'd was been talking about composition and I was talking about foreground interest and how uh, I like to find some good foreground interest and if there isn't, uh, then when I'm out shooting, I tend to carry like a, a bag of uh, rocks with me and I'll just throw some rocks down uh, to create some foreground interest. Uh, most people got the joke. About two minutes later, one lady went really? I, I don't think I could carry a bag of rocks. I'm not really strong enough. Does that mean I shouldn't shoot landscapes anymore? <laughs> um, it was at that point that I realised sarcasm doesn't really cross national borders. It's very much a British thing. Um, so strong foreground interest is, uh, I think, uh, is very useful. It's not absolutely essential uh, because fundamentally there are no rules in photography. Um, you've probably all heard of the rule of thirds. Uh, the rule of thirds is um, only a weak approximation of something a lot more complex. So don't follow it to the letter. It's a good starting point. It gets you in approximately the right sort of place. Um, but if you always take your pictures with your horizon bang on an upper or lower third and your key focal point bang on an intersecting third, one, all your pictures will look the same and two, they won't actually look quite balanced. Uh, they will feel ever so slightly off um, because thirds doesn't quite work. You need to be ever so slightly above or below. Um, OK, uh, next up, where are we? We're in Portugal now, so we're in Lisbon. In fact, the picture on the left, uh, that's one of three occasions where someone's tried to mug me. A um, little aside from photographic here. Um, I was I was photographing that um, empty plaza one very early morning uh, and two guys walked out of the passageway that you can see in the back left uh, and they walked straight down the middle of my picture and stopped beside me now I was uh, I was on my hands and knees it's a very low angle shot shot with a tilt shift lens uh, and they stood one either side of me uh, and they said something to me in Portuguese I don't speak Portuguese um, I, I speak very few other languages, to be honest. Um, classic Brit, I guess. Uh, and I, uh, I 
shrugged my shoulders and said, I don't speak Portuguese. And they switched into English. Uh, and they said, have you got the time? And I said, oh, yeah, it's whatever time it was. And then one of them said, you got a light? I said, no, I don't have a light. Uh, and I looked at the guy on my left as he looked over at the guy on the right and he nodded. Uh, and I thought, oh, this isn't good. Uh, so I decided to stand up. Now, what you can't tell from a webcam is that I'm quite tall. Uh, I'm six foot four. Uh, and when I stood up and they were both just below my shoulder, the guy on the right looked at the guy on the left and shook his head. And they said, have a good day and turned and walked away very quickly. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yeah, it's quite convenient being tall uh, at times. Anyway, um, tilt shift lenses. The reason this is in here is for me to talk about tilt shift lenses. Um, and I, as I said, I'm a massive fan of, uh, of TSE lenses for landscapes. They're more commonly used for architecture shots, like the picture on the right, which is exactly why that one's in there, because they allow you to get your verticals vertical. Um, but I love using them for landscapes as well, because I think... Um, you know, most people will shoot landscapes on 1635, for example, or 1735, um, somewhere around that kind of focal range. Uh, and the trouble is when you shoot with those sort of focal lengths, particularly at the wide end, uh, as I'm sure you're all aware, when you tilt the camera up or down, you end up with your converging verticals. And uh, many people will say, well, clearly that doesn't make a lot of difference when you're photographing a landscape that doesn't have any vertical buildings in it. Uh, to which I say hogwash. It makes a whole world of difference because it fundamentally changes your composition. And I'm very aware of converging verticals, even in a scene where there are no verticals. Um, the, just the whole perspective shift of, uh, of the scene really bugs me, which is why uh, I'm a, a, a tilt shift user. So I use a 24 mil tilt and shift. Um, Moving on, having talked about uh, having talked about uh, reflections um, and composition, there is no reason why, in my opinion, you, you shouldn't put a horizon right across the middle of the frame. Uh, if you've got a, a mirrored reflection um, and you know something that's as clean as that, why not put it in the middle of the frame? Um, it theoretically goes against the rules, um, but but to be honest, I uh, I quite like to go against the rules from time to time. So this is in China. Um, it is the Forbidden City. It's the, the back corner of the Forbidden City in Beijing. Um, if you've not been to China, another interesting place to go to. I had uh, four school aged girls run around a mountain because they'd seen me from a distance just so they could have their picture taken with me. <laughs> they had no idea who I was. But I was a very big white guy and they wanted their picture taken with me. In fact, Tiananmen Square is the other side of this um, is the other side of this uh, uh, forbidden city. Uh, and walking around there, um, I, I had people come up to me. So oh, can, can, can you take a picture? And I was like, yes, I can take a picture of you. No, no, we want to take a picture with you. Um, so so there are people's mobile phones in China full of pictures of me looking slightly confused and very tall. Um, uh, it's an interesting experience, is China, um, and uh, probably off the travel list for a little while, I'd have thought. Uh, okay, um, I think having mentioned perspective, that changing your perspective is very, very important. Um, I, I'm going to say hands up, but but you can all refuse to admit this, um, but I'm sure some of you do it. How many of you get your tripod out uh, and just extend the legs, put it down? put the camera on top of it and start taking pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone willing to admit to it? Sometimes. 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 OK. Uh, in which case, you are not making the best use of your tripod. Tripods are not there to hold the camera at your eye level uh, or, or make it easy for you to see what's going on with the camera. They're there to hold the camera steady in a position you otherwise couldn't put it in steadily. Um, and the way you should be working with a tripod is you should be looking through the viewfinder or using your live view to figure out exactly where the camera needs to be uh, in terms of position, side to side, but also in terms of elevation. Once you've decided on that position, you then bring the tripod in to put the camera there. So I'll get my camera and I'll kind of be up and down and left and right until I'm like, OK, it's about here. I'll get the tripod in and then I'll micro adjust up and down. Pictures like this, obviously, um, you know, I would never see a picture like this if I just set the camera to standing height. 
Um, and in actual fact, I was lying flat on my back, looking up through the poppies. Um, I could tell you it was some great creative thought I had about looking up through the poppies, or maybe it was just I was a bit tired and felt like a lie down in a poppy field and then went, oh, that's quite a nice shot. Let me take that one. Um, I'll let you decide which one it was. Um, but tripod use and getting your camera elevation uh, correct are incredibly, incredibly important. And I'm hoping, yes, good. We're going to have a picture now. Uh, uh, are we going to have a picture now? I think we're going to have a picture now. Come back. Well, we're going to have this picture now. Um, as an example of elevation, this is getting my camera incredibly low. Um, cameras, uh, in my opinion, are tools to do a job. Uh, if I have to risk them getting a little bit wet, then they will risk getting a little bit wet. But I use a good tripod. Um, I use a Gitzo tripod. Uh, it's incredibly strong. It's quite happy to sit in water for a long time. Uh, and if that's where the picture is, then that's where the picture is. Uh, so putting the camera nice and low if you think about the foreground, the midground, and the background of your landscape picture, you may say, "Oh well, you know, how can it uh, how can it make uh, that much difference um, if I'm you know six inches higher or six inches lower?" But what it affects is the middle ground, uh, and it affects the balance between the foreground and the background. Essentially, if you think that you raise your camera up, what's going to happen is that the midground is going to open up. And if you lower your camera down, the midground is going to collapse. And it's the depth of that midground that really fundamentally affects the balance between the foreground and the background. If you want to try and get your approximate thirds, the elevation to the centimetre is crucial. Uh, and that's why it pays to spend time going up and down and up and down, just a little by little, to try and find exactly the right spot. OK, lens choice. Uh, moving on to lens choice. So this is a stitched panorama. Anyone want to tell me where that is? It's not in Essex, I can tell you that. Uh, Derwent Water. Oh, it, 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 it's, it's not Derwent Water, but you're very close. It's, it's one. It's Bartimir. one Bartimir. Bartimir, Bartimir, it is. So this is the top of Fleetwith Pike. Um, incidentally, a great place to wild camp is the top of Fleetwith Pike. You can go drive to the Honister Slate Mines and then take the short walk up the, out of the back of the Slate Mine and camp quite happily on top of Fleetwith Pike. Wake up to this view. Um, so this is a stitch panorama. Uh, it was shot on an EOS R. There are 15 frames in this stitched. Um, it's one of the few times I will spend time on a computer. Um, and to give you the comparison, this is the 24 mil tilt and shift lens version. So this is, I guess, the, probably the common view that you would expect someone to take from the top of Fleetwith Pike, where you've got the, the footpath that comes up the ridge of Fleetwith out of Buttermere. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's an appropriate focal length. It's got everything in. You can see down the Buttermere Valley um, all the way out to the Moray Firth. Um, and in fact, you know, I told you that I don't do much post-processing. Uh, I can tell you that this one has literally been Wi-Fi'd from the camera to the phone and then sent to the computer to put into a presentation. And the way I can tell you that is because there are three dust spots that I can see. Um, uh, there's one just above the skyline right in the middle, just above the yeah. distant mountain. Uh, in fact, there's four. And then there's two on the top left of the cloud and one just to the right of it. Uh, so that's how little post-processing I do to my pictures. That's straight out of camera. Um, OK, but that wasn't really what I was trying to tell you. What I wanted to tell you was that lens choice um, is, uh, is a good way of finding different pictures. OK, so I've shown you the stitch panorama, which is giving you the big wide view. This is the 24 mil tilt and shift. The picture you're about to see was taken from exactly the same location. Literally, I just switched lenses. Oh, the suspense. There you go. Uh, so what did I switch the lenses to? I'm going to I'm going to skip back uh, and show you uh, try and well, uh, explain where it is. If you look at the bottom of the bottom ear lake now, uh, where that where the line of trees are, um, that is what this picture is. Uh, and that is my other favorite landscape photography lens alongside my 24 mil tilt and shift it's 100 to 400 uh, but in this case it's 100 to 400 with a two times extender at 800 mil 
being able to pick out details in a landscape gives you so many more options. It's not just about thinking about the wide view and capturing everything you can see, but it's about looking for interesting patches of light, looking for interesting things going on, like the tractors uh, going around the fields, uh, the little bit of reflection of the trees at the bottom of the lake, uh, and then the wind just wisping across the water right down at the foreground. Um, so think not just about wide lenses for landscapes, but also think about long lenses. Um, and so those of you that go, oh, I haven't got a super wide lens, you might not have, but you might have a 75 to 300 or 25 to, or, sorry, 55 to 50 or something similar. You can still go out and shoot great landscapes with it. Just think differently. Think about capturing uh, sections of a scene rather than the whole thing. Uh, and having explained that I like 100 to 400 with a two times extender, um, I have a bit of a thing for uh, Frankenstein lens setups. Uh, so this is an EOS R with a control ring adapter and a two times extender on a 24 mil tilt and shift with a series of filters on it. Um, I approach my photography, all photography, in fact, with the question, what if? Um, and I think that questioning approach is incredibly valuable uh, because it means that I rarely come away with the same pictures twice. Um, in fact, I rarely come away with the same pictures as anyone else because I'm trying something completely weird, um, like creating a 48 mil tilt and shift lens, because obviously that's the most logical thing to do with it. Um, but I don't have a 50 mil tilt and shift. I could buy one, but they're expensive uh, and it'd be another lens to carry. But a two times extender that I can put on 24 mil or I can put on 100 to 400 gives me versatility in my bag uh, and saves me carrying uh, too much weight. Chris has been out shooting with me. Not recently. It's been a long time since we last went out shooting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> too long, in fact. Uh, it's a very long time. But I think you'll probably remember that I always used to have a very overfilled camera bag of all sorts of yeah. random bits and pieces. Um, I, I like to carry the earth with me. Um, but if I can cut down just a little bit, it's as I get older, it's ever more, uh, ever more beneficial. Um, OK, back in China, the Great Wall of China. Um, I stepped onto the Great Wall of China the first time I went there uh, and I had one of those moments where I couldn't quite believe I was on the Great Wall of China. Um, and I knew that I would like, I, I was there not to photograph specifically, I was on a trip giving some workshops, um, but I'd taken this trip to the Great Wall and I knew I wanted to capture it at uh, sunset. Unfortunately, Great Wall of China closes well before sunset. But if you can explain to me how they can close however many thousand kilometers of wall, I'd love to know and I'm sure they would too. Um, all, all I did was hid out in a guard house for a while. Um, I, I walked out, walked up along the steps as far as I could go and the very end guard post uh, that was kind of decrepit, I just hid in there until everyone had gone, uh, all the guards had gone uh, and then had the entire Great Wall to myself for sunset. Um, it, it did mean quite a long walk down because what they actually close is the bus that runs you up and down the hill um, or the, the slide that you can slide down on. Um, but it was entirely worth it to, to be able to have um, the, the wall effectively to myself. If, however, you don't get the opportunity to have a location to yourself and there are people moving around, uh, I mentioned filters before, um, the stopper filters, so things like the little stopper and the big stopper, particularly the big stopper, uh, and even more so the super stopper, um, if you'll pardon my French, are what I like to call the fuck off filters. Because they make everyone disappear. <laughs> you just set a really, really long exposure and anyone that's moving becomes a ghost. Um, it's a really good way of, uh, of getting the place all to yourself um, without actually getting it all to yourself. Uh, OK, moving on. So we're back in Taiwan now. And uh, I'd, I'd mentioned location scouting and I just want to talk to you a little bit more about it. I'd seen a picture of this location. It, it wasn't a particularly good picture. Um, I still to this day can't remember where I saw it. It may have been on a postcard. It may have been walking through an airport or maybe it was on the phone or something. Anyway, I saw a, a picture of this location. I was like, oh, that's, that's somewhere I have to go while I'm in Taiwan. Um, and so on that month long drive around the country, um, I kept looking out for it. 
I you know, everywhere I went and I did drive basically all of Taiwan. Um, I was looking out for this this spot for where this um, it's called the Eye of Xindian because the, the the area of Xindian is called Xindian. But I didn't know that at the time. All I knew, all I had was the picture. Um, anyway, so I'm driving around, driving around all month. And at the end of the month, I'm on my way back into Taipei. And I'm slightly annoyed at the fact that I haven't managed to find this location. Uh, and I came round this on ramp. And as I drove round it, and it is literally two kilometers away from where my girlfriend's flat was. My ex-girlfriend was uh, was Taiwanese um, and her parents lived literally two kilometers away from this. Um, as I drove round it, I went, hang on, this looks familiar. I was, you know, at car level. I was like, hang on, I'm going round this. Uh, this could be it. This could be it. So I pulled over, uh, stopped, got out of the car, had a little look around, got a map out. I was like, that, that must be it. And then went on um, to find where I needed to be to shoot it, which involved walking through a homeless camp, um, which was interesting in itself, scaling some walls. You can kind of see some of the wall on the left hand side um, uh, just to get to to this spot. Um, but really, the whole point about it is to say you need to keep your eyes open and be aware for any opportunity that presents itself. Um, sometimes you're looking for them. Sometimes they just jump upon you. Uh, and I think that then goes to talking about not just photographing the first picture you see. Quite often you'll see um, you'll see a shot, you'll capture that picture and you'll pack up and move on to the next thing. But actually spend time in a location, just sit and look and listen uh, and really absorb everything that's going on. And I guarantee you will find far more than just the original shot that you thought you were going to capture. Uh, OK, moving away from landscapes to the top of a yacht, because um, that's such an obvious transition, Dave. Um, so uh, I like to put myself in slightly strange uh, places as well. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, nothing is um, too much trouble for a decent picture. Uh, so this is the top of a 30 meter mast. Uh, it is not a remote camera. It is not a drone. Uh, it is me climbed up the mast, uh, hanging in a little harness, trying to um, frame up a shot. Uh, which, even though we were at anchor, um, those of you that remember your Pythagore uh, Pythagorean theorems, uh, we'll know that if the boat is moving a little bit, the top of the mast is moving a lot. Um, in fact, I did work it out that if the boat moves three degrees, I think it was, if the boat rocks three degrees either way, it's like a 15 foot swing at the top of the mast. Um, not good if you get seasick. Um, not good if you have vertigo. Um, but entirely worth it for for a decent and different picture uh, of uh, of a yacht. Uh, and having done it at anchor, I kind of felt I needed to do it under sail as well. Um, this is somewhere in the mid-Atlantic. Uh, and I can tell you that when you're under sail, you rock far more than three degrees in either direction. Um, in, in both cases, actually, it's the same two girls uh, that are uh, on the sunbed. One of them is my fiance. Um, I, I may have called down. In fact, on the previous picture, I may have called down and, and said to them, uh, do you know what would make this picture even more saleable? They muttered something about off, something off. I heard. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't sure exactly what it was, but um, I, I got the feeling that no was what they meant. Well. Um, yeah, I got the feeling that no was what they meant. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so yes, uh, I think going to strange places or taking different views, it kind of goes in with talking about the elevation of your picture thinking about what a picture might look like from a different height um, always yields interesting results. Uh, and since we're all shooting digital, uh, I'm guessing we're all shooting digital. When I saw you all, none of you looked old enough to have shot film. Um, OK, I was right. None of you were old enough to have shot film. I was expecting someone to shoot me down then, but apparently not. It's old enough to be polite. <laughs> If you've shot film, it's only because you fancy being a bit retro. You wonder what all the jazz was about, right? Um, it doesn't cost you anything to, to, to try things out with a digital camera. So giving it a go 
questioning or asking what if what if I got to the top of the mast and took a picture what would it look like um, give it a go find out you can always delete it afterwards if it didn't work out or just not tell anyone um, okay um, we are uh, we're actually back in Death Valley um, and this is so that I can talk to you just a little bit about black and white I love black and white um, and it's about being again it's about being aware of your surroundings so for me you know the sand dunes are beautiful i love shooting in sand dunes um but here what i was most interested in was how the sand dunes and the patterning in the sky was what lined up and it's the sort of thing that many people will pass by they they'll see the sand dunes they will not see the sky at all um and you know it's this is fairly middle of the day ish actually um not middle of the day it's kind of early afternoon so there's nothing super special going on with the light, but spotting that the clouds uh, and the patterning of the sand kind of mirrored each other made for an interesting picture. And that's where, going back to what I was saying about just sitting in a location, paying attention to it, uh, absorbing what's going on, uh, pays dividends. Uh, where are we going to now? Oh, we've got, we've got, another, we've got another reflection, because why not? Uh, so this is in Norway. Um, uh, again, I guess... Um, a bit of location scouting or, or being aware of your surroundings. I was driving around Norway. Um, I'd been giving some lectures um, and then I had a couple of days off and decided I'd go over to um, the Trolltonga, the Trolls Tongue, uh, to go and camp up there and, and do a bit of photography. And as I was driving, um, I drove along this lake. And if any of you ever drive along a lake like this and you see that and you don't stop and take pictures, just sell your camera okay <laughs> because if you see something like that you are duty bound to get out and take pictures of it okay um again it's this is not early or late in the day this is middle of the day while i was driving um but the lake was so beautifully calm and obviously you've got that massive foreboding rock face in the background uh, and then the spectacular green that just really pops out with the little red houses i love the fact they have red houses it makes it so primary um you, you absolutely have to get out and take that picture. And in fact, I, I got out to take this picture and then spent the next four hours walking up and down the shore looking for more pictures. Uh, ended up being very, very late getting to where I wanted to be. Um, but being late uh, is, uh, is always acceptable when you've come away with pictures. Um, and from a sun, sunset perspective, uh, the biggest mistake I see people make is packing up as soon as the sun has disappeared below the horizon. Um, it's usually because uh, dinner's waiting, is what I've been told. Um, but dinner will always wait. Uh, the, the 20 to 30 minutes after sunset are far and away the more interesting times. Um, I'm sure most of you know that, but it's good to be reminded of it from time to time. Uh, OK, uh, next up. Oh, Look at that. Hang on. Was that, did we, no, we, no, we didn't. OK, good. So now we've moved on to um, portraits. I thought we'd skipped one. Uh, we haven't skipped one. So we moved on to portraits and you're going to see, I think, three pictures of this same guy. Um, it looks like it was shot in a studio. It kind of goes back to me talking about flash. This was not shot in a studio. It was shot on a beach in Mallorca. Uh, this guy is hugely interesting. His name's Elmar Sprink. Uh, he um, does Ironman triathlon, um, which in and of itself is not super interesting. I've done Ironman triathlon. It's not any amazing great feat. Um, but what's interesting about him is that I don't know if you can see the scarring all down his chest. Um, he had a heart transplant. So he actually died. Uh, and was resuscitated, spent six months in hospital. Then they decided he need, needed a new heart. Um, and he got his new heart, came out, and then continued doing Ironman triathlons. He's already done them beforehand. Um, interestingly, he's quicker with his new heart than he was with his old heart, um, uh, which has led him to say he's German, but it's led him to say that he now has the heart of a, or the engine of a Ferrari in the body of a Cortina. Um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, so I was shooting a documentary about him, uh, a film documentary that was on German TV a couple of years back, uh, and I was also shooting the stills for it, uh, and I wanted some kind of dramatic uh, pictures of him, something strong, and uncommonly I faced him into the light. So if you're photographing pictures of people, um, I highly recommend you put their back to the sun if you can, 
because uh, otherwise they look all squinty. But for him, I faced him into the light because I wanted him to look a little bit um, like he was a bit Clint Eastwood squinty, like he was a bit harder um, than Smiley. Uh, and then I filled him in with flash uh, and I used high speed sync flash to try and make that background go a little bit darker. Uh, so high speed sync is where you can set your shutter speed to faster than the sync speed, the sync speed being between 160th and 320th of a second, depending on your camera. Um, this means that actually in this case, it was more like 1500th of a second was my shutter speed, which allowed the background to get darker. Uh, thereby he stands out against the background because he's lit with flash. Uh, so he has that little bit of pop and that's what gives it that studio feel. Um, like it was shot on a green screen or something and then a background dropped in. Okay, next up is him on a bike. Um, and those of you that want to photograph sports, um, particularly action-y sports, uh, my advice is always remember you're not photographing the sport, but you're photographing the environment in which the sport happens with the sport going on in it. Uh, so this is in, uh, again, it's in Mallorca. It's a place called Sacalobra. Any of you that are uh, cyclists, this is an absolute mecca. Um, thousands of upon, upon thousands of people go there every year and ride up and down this nine or ten kilometre long dead end road because uh, it's a great long hill to train on. Um, and I was driving along. We were doing some filming. We wanted to do a training sequence going up and down Sacalobra. Uh, and I'd seen this picture in my mind as we drove towards it. Uh, but I knew I wanted to photograph it at sunset. So we came back just as the sun was starting to dip. And there is flash in this image. In fact, there's two flashes in this image. Um, there's a lot going on complexity wise in this picture. Um, and in fact, it's probably one of the most technically complex pictures uh, that I've taken. So if I talk you through it to try and give you an idea of my mindset and how I think about my pictures, I always start with the background first. So I looked at the sky. I knew that I needed an ND grad to try and hold the sky down. So I get an ND grad in, but I can't be too heavy on the ND grad. Otherwise, I'm liable to end up with a dark band running across that mountain uh, in the background. As it is, the top is a little bit darker, um, but not a lot darker. So I get my ND grad in. I also know that he's moving, so I want my shutter speed to be fairly quick so that he's frozen. Um, but that means that the light coming from the sun isn't going to be very strong on his left hand side. So now I'm thinking to myself, right, I need to put a flash gun in. And if you look just to his left, there's a kind of a bright tuft of grass, which um, I guess any normal person would have cloned out. Um, unless it was who was talking about cloning earlier on and was failing, you'd have probably left it in. But but anyone else would have probably taken the time to clone it out. Um, I leave it in because it's like a little signature of how I took the picture. Basically, that flash is going to provide the light on his left hand side, mimicking the sun and a little bit of shadow over to the right hand side um, so that he stands out sufficiently against that uh, the grey tarmac. And then I think to myself, well, actually, the foreground's probably going to get a little bit dark, too, because the shutter speed's got to be fast enough. But I want enough depth of field uh, from my uh, aperture to to get a lot of things sharp. So foreground to background. So now I need another flash, which I'm hand holding just to the left of camera, just to light that little tuft of grass in the foreground. And the question that normally comes is how many takes did it take for you to take that? That's a lot of takes. How many how many attempts did it take for you to <laughs> capture that picture? Um, and the answer is three. And uh, the first two that went wrong weren't my fault. Uh, and I say that um, with an entirely straight face. Uh, because the reason is he's German, as I explained. Uh, and because he's German, uh, when uh, when I said cycle three feet out from the white line, he thought I meant three metres out from the white line and rode down the right hand side of the road. Um, so eventually I just had to tell him to aim for a little grease patch on the road um, because we just couldn't get distances correct. Um, so, yeah, that's, uh, as I say, it's a pretty complex picture. Um, and I, I hope a fairly illustrative way about how I occasionally go about taking pictures and the sort of things that I would think about uh, when faced with a scene. And it leads me to talk uh, as a little aside, and you can all answer this question. Um, I mentioned depth of field, uh, and I'm going to ask you 
the question of all the things that you can change, all of the parameters you can adjust uh, when you're taking pictures, which one gives you the greatest control over depth of field? Aperture. Lens. Eyes. Lens. Focal length. Okay, so we've had aperture, ISO, focal length. Any advances on any of those? How close is to the lens? How close what is to the lens? Subject. Subject. Okay, whoever said that, I didn't see your name, but you get a gold star. Um, it is not aperture. Aperture does control depth of field. It certainly does, but it's not the greatest control of depth of field. And for those of you that think I've just destroyed everything you'd ever learned about photography, uh, I shall prove it to you. So what I would like you to do is to put your hand up at arm's length like this. Put one finger up. I'm hoping you can all see me. Um, put one finger up and focus on your finger. And with your peripheral vision, uh, have a look at how in or out of focus the background is. And the answer should be, and it will be partly dependent on how far away the background is, uh, the answer should be it's sort of in focus, but it's kind of a bit fuzzy. Um, now, if you keep your finger up, and keep your eyes focused on your finger and bring it closer to your face like this. Um, apart from the fact that you all go cross-eyed, which is quite funny if I could see you. Um, what should happen is that the background gets even more fuzzy. It gets even more out of focus. Um, if that's not the case, then I'd recommend an appointment at Specsavers. Uh, your eyes and camera lenses do exactly the same thing. You get closer to your subject, the background gets more fuzzy because your depth of field is compressed. Um, and you should, you can and should make use of this all the time when you're taking pictures. Yes, aperture will control within a given distance. But if you walk closer to your subject, you're going to flatten your depth of field. If you get further away, you're going to expand your depth of field. Um, and obviously, it's therefore the combination of aperture and distance to subject that determines exactly how much you've got. Um, anyone that shot macro should have known this. You probably did know it instinctively because when you get very, very close to your subject, um, even at f22, your depth of field is like this. Um, and it's simply because you are so close to your subject. Uh, OK, uh, and then the last picture of him. Um, again, another flash picture. Uh, because I, I think Flash is fabulous. Um, basically, uh, I think, uh, you know, in this case, this is back up in the Chamonix Valley. This is the this was taken on the same day as the picture of the lake that I showed you. Uh, these were the pictures I was supposed to be taking. The lake was just a bonus. Um, I, uh, you know, I wanted to get some shots of him running around the mountain. And as he came running around, I knew if you look at the picture, there's a big shadow of, of him in the foreground, which is clearly coming from the sun. So he would have been an absolute silhouette if I hadn't used flash to fill him in. Um, and that's where flash gives you the opportunity to get pictures that you simply couldn't do otherwise. OK, moving on uh, a little bit of macro. Um, so I'm a, I'm, I'm a lover of macro. I go in and out of phases of shooting. I've actually done a lot more macro recently um, because, well, what else is there to shoot, really? Um, this was taken in Thailand, uh, and this is one of the laziest pictures I've ever taken. Um, I was in a swimming pool outside my, uh, my hotel bungalows, um, back deck when I saw these dragonflies flitting around so I went back into my room uh, I got my camera and my 100mm macro lens and then I just walked around in the swimming pool for a while watching them land on the little island in the middle of the pool um, uh, an incredibly agreeable way to, uh, to photograph uh, insects uh, it's totally handheld uh, one of the benefits I've, I'm the lover of the 100mm macro with image stabilizer um, but obviously it's incredibly bright as well. Um, and uh, having talked about depth of field, oh, come back, no, come back, oh, come back, there we go. Having talked about depth of field, um, 
normally in a landscape, for example, your depth of field is a third in front of your point of focus and two thirds behind your point of focus. That's where we get the concept of hyperfocal focusing, i.e. focusing like a third of the way in approximately. Um, when you move to macro, once you start getting closer than about 20 or 30 centimeters to your subject, that switches and your depth of field becomes much closer to 50-50. So 50% in front of the point of focus and 50% behind. Uh, and that's very worth remembering if you want to do any macro work, because you may it may alter where you put your point of focus. OK, another um, uh, another Frankenstein lens set up here. Uh, this is um, an EOS R. This was only taken last week, actually. Uh, this is an EOS R uh, and it's got a control ring adapter. It's got a two times extender. It's got a 12 mil extension tube and a 100 mil macro. Uh, it's very odd. I don't think many people have done it. Um, the, the picture on the right looks slightly rude, but the clue as to what it is is in the picture on the left. Uh, it is a lily. Um, it's, it's when you look at a lily, uh, lily petal when it's open, there are some tiny little bumps um, and it's obviously one of those bumps. Uh, you can see the texture and detail on it. You can see that razor thin uh, band of uh, focus um, and I think that combination um, not that combination so if I switch the 12 mil out for the 25 mil extension tube that combination gives me almost 2.7 times life size magnification um, so it's a you know it's a slightly cheaper way rather than buying the MPE 65 which gives you up to five times um, it's about finding versatile approaches to getting different pictures. Um, so, you know, look at your lenses and figure out if, if you've got extension tubes or extenders uh, and extension tubes, incidentally, are a great cheap way of getting macro uh, capability or semi macro capability on many lenses. Um, Dave, can you uh, explain what an extension tube actually just does? Is it just a... I can, yes. So... Um, an extender obviously has optics in it and it multiplies your focal length. An extension tube has no optics in it. Um, it's literally just a tube that moves the lens away from the film plane or sensor. And what that does by moving the lens further away, it allows you to focus closer. So let's say that um, that 100mm macro lens can focus at, what, 30, I think it's 32 centimetres off the top of my head. That's its closest focusing distance. If you put an extension tube in there, you can bring that down to maybe 15 centimeters. Um, on some lenses, uh, for example, there's a 24 mil tilt and shift in the background of that picture on the left. With the 25 mil extension tube, the focus point is actually inside the front of the lens. <laughs> in other words, it's unusable. Um, <laughs> but, but basically, an extension tube, it moves the lens further away so you can get in closer to your subject, thereby getting greater magnification. They're not super expensive. Uh, I've got the Canon ones, but, you know, you can use, uh, you get third party ones. Just try and make sure that you get the ones that have the connections so that it can still control the aperture. Um, and it's a it's a great cheap way of getting some interesting macro uh, type of re results. Uh, in fact, a friend of mine, I was talking to him about this the other day, and he said he was going to go off and give it a try. Uh, and he sent me a picture of his nifty 50. So he's like 90 pound 50 mil lens with some extension tubes. Uh, in fact, they used to be my extension tubes many years ago. In fact, Chris, you may know him. Do you remember Tony Marsh? Yeah. Yeah, it was Tony. Uh, so he, he's got my old extension tubes. Uh, and I think he used about a 25 minute extension tube and a 1.4 times extender. And I think he said he got about 1.8 times magnification <laughs> with a 50 mil lens. Um, so it's if you've got extension tubes, it's worth uh, worth experimenting with. Uh, and if you want to try macro there, are, as I say, a cheap way of getting into it. Uh, OK, moving on. Uh, let's talk a bit about wildlife. Um, Yes, let's talk a bit about wildlife. OK, so uh, having talked about elevation in uh, in your picture being very important for uh, landscapes, it's also super important uh, when you're photographing animals, because if you take a picture of your cat or your dog 
and you're standing at your height and they're on the floor, you get a very dull picture of your cat or dog. If you can get to their level, you create a substantially more intimate portrait or more intimate picture. In this case, obviously, it's that eye contact peeking through the, the hoof of the water buffalo that's being devoured um, that, that really makes uh, the, the strength of the picture. But it's being at the eye level. If I was looking down, obviously, I'd never have seen the eyes. Um, it would have felt so much less uh, impactful uh, as being able to get low. So in this case, I was kind of leaning out of the side of a safari vehicle, trying to get as low as I could um, just to get down to, to eye level. Um, occasionally, wildlife finds you. Um, so this is not a captive cheetah. This is an entirely wild cheetah. Her name is Malaika. Uh, and this is a situation that will probably never happen again. Um, largely thanks to American and Chinese tourists. Um, what used to happen in the, in the Mara and, and in other places where you could go on safari uh, was that um, occasionally some cheetahs may get up onto the vehicle. And they do it because cheetahs are daytime hunters and they hunt by sight. Uh, and they like standing on mounds, which is where you get the classic picture of a cheetah on a mound, because um, then they can see over the grass. As far as they're concerned, um, a vehicle is just a big mound. So I was on safari in Kenya and I was hosting a safari group and this cheetah decided that she was going to climb up and, and get onto the vehicle. Now she was quite well known for doing it. Her name was Malaika. Um, and, but this time she brought her cub with her. So I actually had uh, her and her young cub up on the vehicle with me, uh, probably for about two hours. Uh, and I started off, you know, cheetah gets up on your vehicle, you do what everybody does, you just start shooting pictures, lots of pictures, because, oh my God, there's a wild cheetah and it's three feet away from me and there is nothing between me and it. Um, and then eventually the photographer in me kicked in and went, hang on a minute, Dave, she's back there. These pictures aren't going to be that great. We should do something about that. Uh, and going back to that point about carrying an awful lot of stuff with me all the time, I'm probably the only person that's ever been on safari and taken a big reflector with them in the vehicle, because obviously I'm going to need a reflector in a vehicle. Um, anyway, she, she was there. I thought, oh, I've got a flash gun. Maybe I'll use flash. And then I was a little unsure how she'd respond to Flash. And I didn't want her to lash out in fear or, or jump and fall backwards and injure herself because that would all be very bad. Um, so I, I decided not to use Flash. And then I thought, actually, I've got that reflector. So I got my reflector out and it's, um, it was quite a large reflector. Uh, and I gradually raised it up ever so slowly just to see what she did. She completely ignored it. She was entirely focused on what was going on somewhere hundreds of meters away that I clearly couldn't see. Um, and if you look in her eye, you can just see the half moon shape of a reflector, um, which is what's giving her that that front light. Otherwise, I say she would have been a, she would have been a silhouette. Um, so um, I know it's not always practical to carry everything with you, um, but sometimes it does pay dividends. And having said that this won't happen anymore, uh, I'll explain why. Um, as I said, it was the Chinese and American tourists uh, unfortunately, the Chinese tourists uh, like to take selfies. Um, and so they've put their back to a cheetah and, and like put their fingers up like this and tried to and then bumped into the cheetah. Or they've tried to put baseball caps on cheetahs. That's another one they've done. Um, that didn't go so well for them. Um, there's the there's a quite well known story. Uh, it wasn't with the cheetah, with an elephant of the, the Chinese tourist that wanted to photograph a bull elephant. Uh, and the the safari guy, the driver, pulled up alongside this elephant. And before he knew what had happened, the Chinese tourist had jumped out the back of the safari vehicle, run round, stood in front of the elephant, taken some pictures and was left dead after the elephant stamped on him. Um, so don't get out of the vehicle, I think, is what, what we say to that. Um, and the Americans, it's because they want to go back to their um, camps for lunch. Uh, and you end up in a situation where... Uh, the um, the you know the cheetahs on the top of the vehicle and the Americans saying I want to go back to the camp and the drivers saying we can't we've got a cheetah on the vehicle but the drivers work for their tips so they don't want to upset the tourists and the Americans can't understand that it's a wild animal and you can't just shoo it away it's not just going to go you've got to wait for it to go of its own accord 
Uh, and I think what happened was um, eventually enough pressure was put on the driver. The driver started to move. The cheetah slipped, uh, fell down, caught its leg, broken leg, cue dead cheetah, because a cheetah with a broken leg can't hunt. Um, so they, they now, they basically stop this happening. If a cheetah comes over and looks like it's going to get on a vehicle, the driver will drive away, uh, drive a distance away, um, which does lead to some funny encounters of cheetahs basically just following mounds, driving mounds, <laughs> trying to figure out why this mound keeps moving away from it um, uh, until they eventually figure it out or get bored. Um, okay, so that was cheetahs, lions, classic portrait of a lion this is the kind of thing that everybody wants to do uh, when they go on safari uh, they want to get a lovely frame filled portrait of a big male lion um, and this is all well and good but i want you to think about um, putting animals in their environment as well so we go from somewhere hot to somewhere cold uh, this is the dovrefjell national park in norway uh, and this is a musk ox uh, for those of you that don't know what a musk ox is, it's not a bison. Um, it's a prehistoric angry sheep. Uh, they are indeed part of the sheep family. Uh, they have terrible eyesight and they can run at about 40 kilometers an hour for short periods of time. Um, so you don't get too close to them because if you startle them, they will run at you and they will just run over you. Um, anyway, this is a young one. And um, what I was looking for, you know, I, I had all the lovely frame filled portraits. I had the, them butting their heads and whatever. But this is to try and tell you that think of the story you're trying to tell with a picture. Put your uh, put your pictures into context, put your subject into context. Where does it live? What does it do? Uh, what sort of environment does it inhabit? And obviously a picture like this, you know, if, if I just filled the frame with that musk ox it'd be oh look at that poor old cold musk ox but here you're like my god that's a massive environment it's all snowy and cold and how the hell does something ever live in that barren environment other than just picking around in the rocks and the little scrubs it tells a very different story uh, i think that was really my point um paying attention to your subjects is also key uh so i was in norfolk doing some bird photography uh, and I um, had noticed there was like a, a puddle, quite a large puddle, where several birds were going in and uh, having a bath. And having paid attention to that, I was duty bound to go and photograph it as well. So I set myself up face down in the water and the goose poo uh, and waited. Uh, again, it's, it's about going the extra length to get the picture that you want. Um, if I'd taken this from standing height, it would have been ever so dull. Um, but this is also a little bit about breaking the rules. In theory, this entirely breaks the rules because the subject is looking out of the frame to the left. It's got no space to look into. But if you imagine if I'd framed this up the other side, um, all of those water drops, all of that action and drama would have been gone out of the frame and I'd have just been left with a big empty space on the left hand side. So um, pay attention to your subject. Don't feel you have to follow the rules wholeheartedly. Um, okay, if there's if there's barking that you can hear, I'm sorry. I've got a seven-month-old Hungarian Vishla puppy, and I think he's just come back from a walk, uh, and he's going a little crazy in the background. Um, whales, um, again, not following the rules. So this is um, this is a humpback whale. You can see the very distinctive hump. Uh, the classic picture that people want of a whale uh, is the tail. Uh, I do have the tail in this dive sequence, but for me, this is far more the interesting picture. But it's very polarizing because fundamentally photography is subjective, right? Some people would say, oh, I'd much rather see the tail with the water curtain falling off it. Uh, other people will get what I was trying to say about this, which is the humpback and the mountain the, or the apparent mountain of the humpback stacked on mountains and mountains and mountains. Uh, and the other thing to say about this is that paying attention to the light and where the light is coming from, um, dramatically affects your pictures. So this is obviously a backlit scene. Um, in the UK, we're very often taught to shoot with the light coming over our shoulder um, because then our subject is all beautifully lit. Uh, it misses so much uh, in photographic opportunities. And I urge you to try shooting across and into the light if you don't do it very often. By shooting kind of towards or sort of towards and across the light here, you can see that haze just to the right of the humpback. 
Uh, that's the moisture from its breath hanging in the still evening air that if it wasn't backlit would not stand out at all. It would just be all lost against the mush of the background. But because those mountains are dark behind, um, the, the bright water vapour in the air really stands out and just adds an extra dimension to, to the picture. Uh, and again, I was trying to get as low as possible. So I'm leaning over the side of the boat. The, the camera is as close as I dare get it above the water. The boat is very clearly moving. Uh, and I came away actually from this with bruises across my chest um, from from bouncing around on the boat, leaning over the side and, and bracing and trying to trying to get these low level water shots uh, of of humpbacks uh, and indeed blue whales like this. Uh, this is obviously the classic picture that you'd want of a, of a blue whale from a, a whale watching tour. You know, whale fluke up in the air, water curtain uh, dangling down. In this case, great scenery behind, um, pretty much the only place in the world you can watch blue whales and have a background that's not sea, um, because they are genuinely that close in to the, to the shore. Um, so if you want to go whale watching, I do recommend the Sea of Cortez. Um, there are no whale watching operations down there, um, but, uh, but it is possible to do. Uh, and then Having talked a bit about backlight, um, we, you know, we, we have another backlit uh, picture of uh, a blue whale, the biggest breath in the animal kingdom. Um, this is a 30 foot high um, or more spume. And this is what you see most commonly when you're out whale watching. It's what you, you hear certainly from miles away, the big breath. Um, and again, positioning to try and get that backlit against a dark background just adds a whole other dimension to it. It allows you to get pictures that you otherwise would miss. Um, I've just noticed it's seven minutes past nine. Who wants a, a two minute break to get a drink? Yeah, or sounds like a good idea. Keep going. Yeah. Okay, go yeah. get a drink. Right, I'll wait here. You go get a drink. Shout when you're back. So what sort of boats you in there, Dave? Are they um, by just uh, outboard? Uh, yeah, it's um, it's like a eighteen foot uh, fishing boat. All oh, right. Um, yeah, a little fishing skiff with a with an outboard motor on it. Um, there, as I say, there is no whale watching operation there at all. There's only one way you can go whale watching there, and that's to go on a tour with me <laughs> to go and see. A guy who is the key, who is the the only blue whale marine biologist in the Sea of Cortez. Ah. Um, uh, so he basically has a he has a permit to be able to be there through the season, get up close to the whales. I've been close enough that if my arm was like this much longer, I could have touched a blue whale's tail as it was underneath my boat. Um, we can get very close to them um, because he has to identify them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 pretty awesome. Photographing a photographing a blue whale on a twenty four to one hundred five mil lens and twenty four mil not being wide enough because it's so close, <laughs> uh, is quite an experience. Yeah. So how many? Uh, so like, how how long you're out there for, and how how many whales would you expect to see? Huh. Uh, it very much depends. Um, the two tours I've run down there, we've seen whales most days. I've had situations where uh, I've had some days where I've had six blue whales feeding within a kilometre of me. Right. Yeah. Um, you have some days where you don't see much at all. Uh, you see, you know, might see a humpback or maybe a fin whale. Thing is, there's lots of stuff to see. We go for the blue whales, but we see blue whales, humpbacks, fin whales, sea lions common dolphins, um, bottlenose dolphins, lots of seabirds. Um, you know, there's always something there. Occasionally whale sharks, occasionally orca. Pretty much most whale species that exist on the planet can be seen there at various times, mm. um, including some of the incredibly rare beaked whales. What uh, time of year would the trip be, David? Uh, we normally go, um, it's like sort of February time. It's yeah, it's kind of Feb, March is the season. Uh, that's when they're there. Basically, the blue whales go into the Sea of Cortez to feed, basically. And if you get a good, 
yeah, good fight to Plankton Bloom. They hang around for a long time. They can hang around for up to three months. Um, and they, they can be there feeding and, and lunging and just generally pottering around. In fact, in this picture, um, if you look beyond the whale, there's a patch of smooth water. That's another whale that has passed across there. Um, so it's come across in the surface and then dived down and it's left the water being a bit smoother. Uh, so in this, there were actually two blue whales really quite close together. As, as far as they're concerned, they're basically packed in like sardines because um, they're used to communicating over hundreds of miles. Amazing. Well, I think we're all back. Everyone back. Yeah, I, think I, back. Shall, I shall continue. Uh, I was just about to say, I promise I won't keep you that much longer. And then I looked through the remaining slides. Maybe I'll just skip a few. <laughs> or maybe I won't tell you quite so many stories. Uh, OK, <laughs> so uh, let's uh, do something completely different. Uh, anyone want to tell me what this is? So put in a fish in there. I'll let you look a little closer. Someone just led into their monitor. I heard that. It's a person. It is a person. It's got human ears and eyes and a nose and a mouth. Um, so this is a, a project I've, I'm still kind of working on around plastics and pollution. Uh, it's a person body painted as a turtle caught in a fishing net. Um, it's something entirely different sort of stuff I do. Uh, it goes hand in hand with this one, uh, which is a person as well, painted as a koala. Um, this I did for the Australian bushfire. Uh, stuff um, you know when they had all the, the wildlife that was killed in the bushfires um uh so again it's uh it's something a little different to uh wildlife whilst still being sort of wildlife -y. um uh, it's another creative outlet um okay moving on another body paint picture uh, it's the same body paint artist that i work with actually um and this is obviously a field of sunflowers brilliant uh, and uh, and a model painted into into the sunflowers uh, and you know someone said to me a couple of months back god that's an amazing picture i would buy that as a big print from you and then he looked at it closer and he went is she wearing a top oh, i'm not going to buy it now <laughs> i was like hang on i thought you were admiring the body paint you no okay apparently not <laughs> So how do you do that? Do they do you so, work exactly where they're going to be, and then the painter comes in? So in this case, I set I figured out what my shot would be. Uh, I set up my camera on a tripod. Um, it's taken on a seventy to two hundred mil lens. I knew how much depth of field I wanted. I knew where I wanted to position the the model. I take the picture. Um, I Wi-Fi it onto my phone. Gave that to the to the body paint artist so that she could look at it. Uh, and work out what needed to be where on the model. Uh, and then we finish it off by getting the model actually into the location uh, and just touching up the final a little bit to make sure that everything kind of lines up where it needs to be um, so that it, 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 it gives the right effect. Mm. It's, it's quite an involved process. This one probably took uh, three hours, I guess, um, to, to get it done. Uh, more commonly, you see body paint done like the previous two done in a studio where everything's under control. But um, it's much more fun doing it out uh, in in the environment, painting into a scene. Um, OK, body paint. I'll tell you what, I'm going to skip over this one. There's nothing super interesting about this. Uh, we'll just keep going. Um, street. Candid street photography. Uh, captured moments. So this is uh, where are we? We're back in Taiwan. We're in a temple in Taiwan. Um, and... Um, you know, three people praying is not super interesting, but two people praying and a little boy that clearly is very disinterested in praying makes for a much more interesting moment. So I, uh, when I'm shooting street, there are a couple of ways of doing it. You either um, snap what you see when it happens, like the picture I showed you very early on, uh, or you find a location and you just sit and wait uh, and you spend the time waiting for something to happen. In this case, you know, I just I found a nice patch of light um i just hid myself in a corner all set up uh, and just watched people moving around and then when this happens 
you're there to capture that picture. So sometimes it's spontaneous moments. Um, sometimes it's planned spontaneous moments, if that makes sense. Um, again, same temple, actually. There are, it's a temple I've been to a few times, and I know there are some various pools of light. Uh, so again, I positioned myself waiting for this pool of light with the dark background, just watching and waiting for someone to come in and do something interesting. This guy walked in in a very light shirt, gave me that lovely tonal contrast against the background. Um, obviously, such an incredibly interesting weathered face. Um, and, uh, and, and it's all about that light. It's about seeing the light uh, and putting the effort in to wait for it to make the great picture for you. Um, what, sort of, what sort of lens were you using for that picture? 85 mil 1.8. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, one. <laughs> not, no, one. no, not particularly. 85 mil 1.8, is it? It's not the 1.2. That's the expensive one. Uh, the 1.2 and the 1.4 are the expensive ones. The 1.8 is a couple of hundred pounds. Is that the uh, RF? Oh, it's not obviously not the RF mount then. No, that wasn't the RF mount. Uh, that was on. That was on a 5DSR, I think. Um, no, I in, when I'm travelling, I much prefer taking an 85mm 1.8 because it's lighter, it's easier to carry around. Um, and it focuses way quicker than the 1.2. Um, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a, actually a lovely little lens. Uh, OK, um, having I talked about lighting earlier on. This is another example of backlighting. Um, photographing into the light, which gives that lovely rim light around the fisherman uh, and also really makes his net stand out against the background. Um, this guy, I frankly have no idea how they do this. He is literally balanced on one end of a floating boat on the, ed on the, on the very edge of it whilst bending down and picking up nets and working his way through them. Um, and what was more amazing was he then kind of put his net down, realised I was taking some pictures and came over and asked me for beer. Not that I had any beer. Um, <laughs> and that also seemed to be the only English word he knew was beer. He just came over and kept saying beer, beer, beer and held out his hand. I was like, I haven't got any beer. <laughs> um, Can I ask uh, a quick, quick question? Yeah. How, do you, how do you meet her for, for out, and, out and about? How do I meet her? So I shoot, uh, I shoot everything. My camera is always in manual. Uh, and it's always in spot metering for everything. So for me, I will um, pick a tone, pick something that I want to meter from. And this is the great fallacy of evaluative metering. Evaluative metering makes you think that you're going to meter from the whole scene and it's going to get it all correct. Well, it can't meter for everything. It can, it can meter for an average of all the tones, which is what it does. But the reality is if you get one tone in your image correct, everything else will be correct around it. So instead of trying to work out how much shadow and how much highlight you've got in a scene and therefore exactly what your evaluative meter is going to do to it and therefore how much uh, exposure compensation you need to use, in my mind, I think, right, let me go to spot metering. Let me meter from whatever it might be, his, his, his side. You know the lit bit of his side i know that as i look at that that should probably be uh, maybe a stop brighter than a mid-tone let me set that to be a stop brighter than a mid-tone brilliant everything else is going to fall into place around it because you can't change your exposure for every tone in the scene you just need to get one of them right um, and for the way i shoot i think it's much quicker for me to concentrate on one single tone get that correct and just go on with shooting um, that doesn't mean it's the right way to do it. It's just what works for me. Um, I'd recommend you, you give it a go, though. The light bit, then. Pardon? Would you always shoot onto the lighter part, so like where his, where his back meets his side, as it were? Uh, well, in this case, I might have done, but I wouldn't necessarily need to. I could have oh. metered from his hair and right. gone, oh, well, if I meter from his hair, that's going to be two and a third stops darker than a mid tone. Oh, okay. Um, or I could have metered for the light bit of the netting between his hands and gone, well, that's probably two and two thirds of a stop brighter than a mid-tone. So let me set it to plus two and two thirds. Got you. And you're um, just seeing these stops, yeah? That... Pardon? You're just seeing the stops difference in your mind, yeah? Yeah. I mean, it comes yeah. with experience, but also it comes with knowing in this scene, 
if you look at this picture, what's the brightest part of that picture? Down by the water. Down by the water. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. How bright do you want that to be relative to a mid-tone? Very. Yeah. Fairly. Maybe, maybe three stops brighter than a mid-tone. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Why don't you meter off the water and set your exposure to plus three? All right. I see. Now you know that will be the brightest part of your scene and it will not be overexposed. It will be three stops brighter than a mid-tone and everything else will be relative around it. I see. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. It does. Okay, good. Good. Okay. Normally when I explain that in real life, I get a lot of people looking very confused at me. Um, but, but hopefully it kind of makes sense and you can sit and think about it and you know, maybe go and give it a go. Um, for example, if you were doing a landscape and you've got bright white clouds, same deal. Pick the brightest part of the cloud, make it plus three or somewhere around plus three, plus two and two thirds or something. You're probably going to have fairly close to the right exposure. So is this similar to what they call the zone system or is it? I, I guess it probably is. It, it's kind of like the zone system. Um, I don't really think of it in terms of zones. Yeah. Um, I, I just think in terms of what tone do I want to meter from? What tone can I look at in a scene and reliably go, that is this much brighter or darker than a mid-tone? Right. Um, and that, that's just an experience thing, but that comes the more you practice, the more you will, uh, the more you'll figure it out. And if you're, if you're interested in this, I'll give you a bit of homework to do um, to try and start seeing tones. What I want you to do tomorrow or, or, you know, in the daytime, I want you to take your camera, set it to manual mode and spot metering. And then I want you to adjust your exposure until you've got a trial and error process, until you've got the correct exposure for a scene. And it doesn't matter what it is, you could be sitting in your garden. Okay, just get the correct exposure for that. And then look through the viewfinder don't change your exposure settings. Okay, so leave your shutter speed, aperture and ISO wherever you've set them in manual to get the correct exposure. And then just look through the viewfinder and point the camera at different things, or more accurately point the spot meter at different things, different tones, different brightnesses, and see what happens to the exposure scale, because it will go up to the right and down to the left. When it goes up to the right and it goes to plus two, you know that whatever tone you're pointing at is two stops brighter than a mid-tone because you know you've got the exposure correct. When it goes down to minus one, you know that that tone is one stop darker than a mid-tone. Gradually, you keep doing this, you build up a mental map of tones relative to how bright or dark they are to a mid-tone. So for example, why does a gray card work? A gray card works because it's a known value. So for example, it doesn't have to be a gray card. If I had this, if I put this into some light, okay, this is a headphone case. If I put this into some light uh, and I metered from it and I discovered that this was two stops darker than a mid-tone, okay? If I take this same thing and I bring it inside, it's still two stops darker than a mid-tone. So if I meter from this, my exposure will still be correct. You don't need a gray card. You just need something of a known value, okay? By going through that process of spot metering and pointing at different tones, you will learn how bright or dark tones are to a mid-tone and you build up that mental map. It makes it so much quicker when you're out shooting. Okay, right. sermon over. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, moving on, but still in, still in uh, Viet, Viet, Vietnam, this is. Um, short, quick, funny story. I don't speak Vietnamese. I was, um, drive, I was cycling along the Mekong Delta uh, and uh, I was quite high up on the bike and I saw over a, a fence, um, a hedge in fact, I saw this scene, I stopped, I got off my bike, I walked through their front gate, I held up the camera and smiled, they didn't move particularly, they just smiled at me, uh, I took a handful of pictures uh, and then I stood up and the lady in the back corner stood up and picked up what I can only describe as a very big spear. Um, and uh, I was momentarily concerned. And she disappeared off around the back of the house and uh, came back with some fruit. She just cut down off a tree and proceeded to feed me fruit. Uh, <laughs> I guarantee anywhere else in the world I'd have been stabbed. Um, 
this is uh, kind of about um, again that spotting pictures, being being open to seeing pictures wherever you are, and it's something you can train. When I go out, if I've not done much street photography, um, when I go out to take street pictures, it takes my brain and my eye a while to zone back into the sort of shots I want to take. Um, and in this case, I've been going up and down the Mekong Delta for three days, so my eye was in the zone. Um, and when you see these moments, you, you have to capture them. Um, things like this, this is in Beijing. Um, I saw this guy walking his little dog down the alleyway, down the Hatong, and I just set myself up. They were you know, quite a way down the alleyway, uh, but I set myself up and I hoped and prayed that the little dog would walk through the, shade of the, the shaft of light ahead of its owner, and duly it did. Um, and I guarantee like 99 times out of 100, it wouldn't do that. But just occasionally it pays off uh, and you get enough light for the just to catch the eye. Um, otherwise, it would have looked like a black blob on legs. Um, moving on, more fleeting moments. Again, this is in Vietnam. Uh, this looks like it was lit with flash, but it wasn't. It was lit with sunlight. This little boy, um, typical like forest boy, was running around in the woods and he stopped for maybe a second and a half, two seconds, and stared at me. But he happened to stop right in a patch of sunlight. Um, and uh, yeah, my dog's really going for it. Sorry about that. Uh, and he, uh, he stopped in this patch of sunlight. And I just turned. Uh, and because of how I meet her, uh, I could literally turn. And I was at the camera's in manual. Uh, spot meter onto his face. Uh, I know that his face, because he's, uh, he's Asian skinned, um, even though he was in the sun, I know that you know middle of his face is going to be a little bit darker than a mid-tone, um, probably about minus two thirds. So I quickly um, dragged the shutter speed until my exposure meter said minus two thirds, grabbed two frames, and he ran off again. Um, of course you did. Of course you did. Impressive time. Um, <laughs> So, uh, oh, we're in China. We're, we're back in China again. God, we've really bounced around uh, Asia uh, in this, haven't we? Um, this is, a, he was a national Kung Fu champion uh, and a complete pansy. Not that I told him that. He was complaining how hot it was in his silk pajamas um, whilst I was carrying 25 kilos of lighting kit up a hill. Um, thinking of shots here, the reflection is what makes this picture. And unfortunately, when we got there, the light wasn't really in the right place uh, to give a reflection. So I had to create it. So in this case, I've put a flash off camera to the left, slightly in front of him, firing onto him so that the light that bounces onto him then comes back and gives me the strength in that reflection. It makes him stand out against the background. Uh, and a lot of photography, I think, sometimes it's happy accidents. A lot of it's happy accidents, actually. Um, but a lot of it is also planning or foresight, knowing what you want to achieve and then going through the processes required to create that picture. Because photography is, you know, it's, it's a very logical process at the end of the day. Um, and uh, you, uh, you can kind of work your way through it in a very logical manner. Uh, right, next up. Uh, we're in Africa. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're very much running out of time, so I'm just going to skip over this, other than he's a cute little boy in a school in Africa. Um, flash. I've, I've talked about flash a lot. Um, flash can be very dramatic, very obvious. You've already seen some of that. You're going to see one of the pictures again. Or it can be super subtle. Uh, this is in London. It was a fashion shoot for the handbag manufacturers. Obviously, it was styled around breakfast at Tiffany's. Um, and I had an assistant carrying a flash in an octobox walking with the model as she came towards me um, and I was walking backwards just shooting away but the flash really gives a crispness to her skin uh, gives it that kind of glow and just evens out the shadows from the ambient light so you get that lovely even tone on her skin and honestly models like that um, so flash um, you know learning to use flash really pays dividends um, moving on you've seen the picture on the left these pictures were taken about, I'm going to say, four or five years apart. Um, it's probably um, uh, an example of how my style hasn't really changed or evolved particularly. Um, I, I have certain things I like to do. I use flash in, in the same sort of way. The picture on the right was taken uh, in the Lake District back in December. 
Uh, and um, really, for me, it's about making subjects stand out. So, you know, in this case, it's a strong pose. It's a great location. And it's about concentrating not just on the subject, but also where they are, how that should look. So for me, I always start with the background. What light can I not properly control? That's always daylight because I can't shield an entire valley. Uh, so what settings do I need to get the, the ambient light to look how I want it to look? Great, that's done. Now let's put flash in to get the subject to look how I want the subject to look. Um, that's that's my approach, and, and I think it's the most logical way of dealing with flash. Uh, and then we get to some abstracts. I do like some abstract stuff as well. Um, we've okay, we detour from uh, um, portraits. Uh, back in Death Valley, sand dunes. Um, and this is to say, it's not always about the camera that you use. In fact, it's very rarely about the camera you use. People say, oh, you know, you've got, you got nice pictures because, you know, you get to use the best kit. Well, I do get to use most of the best kit. That's true. Um, but that's not what makes the picture. You make the picture. Your eye makes the picture. And this picture, I was convinced for about a year I'd taken it on my 5 DSR, uh, 50 megapixel um, DSLR camera. Uh, it was only when Canon asked me to put together a presentation on their mirrorless range, not the R range, but their EOS M, M50, M5, M6. Uh, I own an M5. Uh, I went through my pictures. I looked at what had been taken on what, and I realized this was taken on my M5, not on my 5DSR. Um, and having realized that, I then spun my brain back to figure out why I'd done it. And the reason was because, as I explained, I'm very lazy when it comes to doing things on the computer. And with a full frame camera, I couldn't get the field of view that I wanted. It was too wide with a 70 to 200 and I didn't have a longer lens with me. Um, and I thought, oh, well, yeah, I could shoot it on my 5DSR and crop it down later, but uh, I'll never bother. I know I won't bother. Uh, so I didn't take it on the 5DSR. I had the lens mounted on the tripod on the tripod collar. I just pulled the 5DSR off the back and put an M5 on it instead. That gave me that effective 1.6 times crop for the smaller sensor. It gave me exactly the field of view that I wanted for the picture. I took the shot and I, I went on and all I had to do on the computer then was make it black and white. Um, it actually gave me a reason to go and make the picture black and white rather than having to do too much and get bored. So don't always think you need the latest camera. Uh, you need the best lenses. What you need is your eye and your um, view as to what picture you want to capture. Um, nearly there, I promise. Um, we're running out of time, but um, I'm sure everybody's enjoying it anyway. <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, some more abstracts. This is part of a, a series that I have been working on for years and will hopefully continue working on forever more. Um, uh, and basically, it's all about um, it's, I call it portrait of an ocean. It's all about pictures of light on water because the water is ever changing. Um, and uh, I, I have a, you know, I suppose this is my creative outlet. I, I love the kind of the abstract nature um, of waves and water and ripples and light and the interaction of all of these things. Um, and it kind of goes back to thinking about things in a different way. It's not always about the big wide view. Um, when you're spending a lot of time uh, on a yacht sailing across the Atlantic, there's a lot of water to photograph. Um, <laughs> Uh, in fact, that's pretty much all there is to photograph. Um, so you do pay a lot of attention to it. But as I say, I've been doing this for years um, and uh, and I think it's it's a lovely thing to do. It's also very calming to just sit and look at the water and watch how light plays on water. Um, so I'd, I'd recommend giving it a go. Uh, and finally, we're all in lockdown. I say finally, pretty much finally. Uh, we're all in lockdown. Uh, and that means that uh, it's harder to go and shoot things. This is my Hungarian Vishla, who you heard barking earlier on. These were taken in the last couple of weeks. Um, there are still things that you can photograph. Uh, obviously, you can do macro. I've been photographing my dog um, with fisheye lenses, because obviously that's totally the most obvious thing to photograph a, a dog with. Um, be creative. Think about photographing things in different ways. Um, don't always take the most obvious approach. Uh, and the final thing I'm going to leave you with is the project I'm working on right now in lockdown, uh, which is doorstep portraits. Um, I have been, uh, I know there's a few photographers have been doing it. Um, I urge you all to give it a go if you have the wherewithal to do it. 
Uh, I've been photographing pictures of people at their front doors. Uh, it started with people on my road. It's now expanded to be uh, the entire area of West Norwood uh, in southeast London, which is where I live. Um, and uh, in, so much so that I have 27 people booked on Saturday and Sunday, um, <laughs> literally to turn up and photograph them. Uh, I'm doing it all free of charge. The uh, I'm literally raising money for the NHS charities together. Um, and last month, I only started a couple of weeks ago, but last month I was in the top 5% of fundraisers on Just Giving. Uh, I, I think £1,420 raised now, £1,430 raised. Uh, I'm hoping to hit 2000 But it's an example that there's always something to shoot. Um, and you just need to think about turning a crisis into, uh, into a positive. Uh, and ways in which you can help get out, shoot. You've got a lot of skills with a camera. Is there something you can do with it? Uh, maybe there is. Give it a go if you if you have the opportunity. Uh, and with that, I'm going to say thank you so much for staying late and listening to me. I'm assuming some of you are still there. Um, I know Chris is. I can still hear him moving around. Um, <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've been, uh, oh, I don't know. I, I wish you've been inspired, but probably not. Uh, maybe you've learned something. Uh, I'd settle for educated, if not inspired or humoured. Um, but any combination of the above would be fabulous as far as I'm concerned. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess that's it, really. That's all I have to say. You can, ah, disappeared. But you can follow me on all of these things here. Cheers, David. Okay. Thank Thanks very much, David. Um, are you, you're about okay if we uh, open the floor to any questions? Yeah, far away. Anybody got any questions? <laughs> Anybody? Hi, um, David. You yeah. Those pictures you were shooting raw and not JPEG. Sorry, what? I'm, I'm assuming you were shooting raw, not JPEG. Yes, I always shoot in raw, um, which if I want to adjust, I can. Um, but fundamentally, the reason I shoot raw is is less for the adjustment capability, more for the range of colors that it captures. If you shoot a JPEG, uh, JPEGs can at most be 8-bit, whereas a raw is, you know, good raw, most good raw these days is 14-bit. So you get substantially more colors. Uh, it's easier to get better color accuracy. Um, and uh, if you're going to print, you've got more color data to work with to get more accurate prints. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, D David, um, you had a, a picture early on in your um, what we've been looking at of, of mount, um, mountain scene with snow on it. And I, there was a very nice sky. I have yep. no idea where it was, but there is a, a very small trace of a vapour trail in it. Would you not have taken that out? Because I look at it and... I can see that vapor. Tr no, uh, it was a, a, a cold scene. Maybe the next one. That one? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't know which one it was now. I can't remember. Not right with the bison. Who? Was it not right one with not a bison? Uh, a muskox. Muskox. No, 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 no. It was early on. Uh, early on. Early on. It, it so a, not, a, not, not was that the one. one no. Blanc, David. A third, a third Scott. Blanc. The one of Mont Blanc. That's, yeah, it that, that's this one. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. We no, can't no. see the right of it though. We can't see Mont Blanc. There it is. There's there the right trail. Now, there's a, a line. Um, oh, here, just here. here. That's not cloud, is it? No, that, that looks to me very much like a vapor trail. Yeah, I go straight to that, and I think that shouldn't be there. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> Do you know? I had never even noticed it until now. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> I have never even noticed it. That's, you know, it's to me. It's reflected in the water. It is reflected in the water here, yeah. 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 To me. Why are you again, David? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, my bad. But that's why I don't judge camera club competitions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, let me, let me uh, fit. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. It, it sticks oh, yeah. out even more now, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You'll I'm, see it now. Thanks. Why don't you I'm mention it? Yeah, you see it. to see that again. Yeah. Honestly. What about the horizon? Is that level? Uh, <laughs> probably not. <laughs> when, honest, when you went for that not. photo, Dave, did you not have the remove the aeroplane trail in your bag along with the rocks? I, do you know, it was the one thing I left at home that day. Uh, 
Did you have the fuck off filter on as well? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was it. I had the shouting at people filter on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't suppose. Yeah, you have yeah, don't suppose you've got a copy of the picture. You know the one where the camera was in the water? You haven't got a picture of what that looked like from the photo that you uh, took. The resulting the picture uh, of, of this one. That one, yeah. yeah. Um, if you keep talking... <laughs> uh, where is that, Dave? Where is that, Dave? Where is that? That's in the Lake District. That's uh, oh, Rydal, Rydal Water. Ah, OK. Um... I am, uh, yeah, if you keep talking amongst yourselves. Um, All right, well, or well just wait, keep, wait, keep talking to me. On the right. Okay. Other questions while he's... Uh, oh, you're all going to see yourself, sorry about that. Right, uh, have they appeared? Come on. Good, I'm waiting. I'm sorry, I'm just waiting for a hard disk to connect. Uh, and then we'll go find a raw file. Um, I okay. think I might be able to find it. <laughs> Um, this is above and beyond the call. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> Come on, connect. It's in there somewhere. So, what camera do you use? Uh, what camera do I use? Um, predominantly, right now, I use an EOS R. Um, uh, but I do still have my 5DSR. Uh, I've got an M5. Um, yeah, but more often than not, I find myself using an EOS R these days. Um, right, uh, where are we? It's not in there. Well, you get to see all the pictures from my workshop this morning. Um, well, somewhere in my loft, I've got an A1 program. Oh. A 70, a D70 before before digital. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, oh, blimey, there's loads of them up there. I think I've, I've got a museum of Canon cameras from the year dot. Fabulous. <laughs> Why don't you get them out and use them? Um, because I'm, 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 as from uh, <laughs> last middle of last year, I'm afraid of having been a Canon user the whole of the time, I've had to jump ship purely because I can't carry it all. And um, what have you jumped ship to? Um, Olympus to Olympus, okay, Olymp yeah, <laughs> yes, okay, right, it's connected. Uh, so now I need to go through a network drive of pictures. So we'll, we'll keep talking. I'll see if I can find it. <laughs> yes. But I must admit, I was very sad to get rid of all my Canon gear. In fact, mm -hmm. I've still got loads of bits around that I bring up the club for you all because uh, things like uh, extension, not extension tubes. Um, Converters. The other things. Converters. The three, yeah. One, one, one point four and a two. Uh, don't know. There were uh, no the um. Extension tubes. Extension tubes. That's it. The F twelve and the twenty five. Yeah, yeah. With the they they are auto. But uh, yeah, we've got loads of bits, haven't we? We'll have to let them have. Uh, any other questions while I'm still looking for this picture? Yeah, one question, sort of, use back, back, back button focus. The image stabilisation on lenses, when is that active? Uh, oh, is it on a half a, half a, shut, a shutter button press? Uh, or the focus button? Or, or it's, all, it's on the focus button as well. It depends on what lens you're using uh, and uh, what mode you've got it set to. So some lenses are have three modes on them normally the super telephotos um, and if you're set to mode three it only fires when i think it's in here somewhere uh, it only fires when uh it's uh it's not in there it only fires when it's about to take the picture or only triggers when it's about to take the picture um if however it's in mode one or mode two uh, it'll be active as soon as you push the back button focus. Yeah, this is the 24 to 105 RF lens. Okay. Uh, it should be active as soon as you start focusing. And if you say, if I take the finger off the focus button? It'll stay active for a little bit of time and then turn itself off again. So then it's not activated again when I press the shutter button? Should be. Should be, okay. 
David. Yes. Uh, just a question on SanDisk for yes. still photography. Yeah. Is the extreme SDHC card as good as you need, or is it worth if you're using high speed motor or Pro Capture and Olympus, would you need something better? So the only time you need something better is if you're going to do video, really. Yeah. It'll help if you're doing um it'll help if you're doing burst because it'll clear the buffer quicker. Um <laughs> But if you're not going to do burst very often, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. What, what is quicker than the extreme? The extreme pro should be a little quicker. A little, uh, a little not, quicker. Not, not much. Not much. So at not 18 much. frames a second, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a big problem. Shouldn't be. No. As I say, the only thing you may notice is it may clear the buffer a little quicker, uh, right. which means if you fill the buffer, you'll get back to shooting a bit quicker on a faster card. But otherwise, it's not going to. You're not going to notice it if you don't do motorsport or fast action wildlife then um you know i wouldn't worry about it lovely thank you a superb you, you realize you're actually getting a view of all of my raw files right now great Clark looking through your underwear <laughs> i know right yeah. well, i'm going back to the uh sand disc yeah. now um what's the difference between uh some of them you've got one little row of little tabs along the top and there's some of them that have got like two rows of two tabs. rows of two rows of connections so uh the difference is uhs1 and uhs2 uh, uhs2 uh, is a faster transfer speed so it's ultra high speed um there it is yeah i think that might be it well, i recognize that stone <laughs> yes, yes. <there> <laughs> Oh, one there you go it was not super exciting uh the colors seem a bit off the white balance is off a bit i think it might be that one or something yeah but it, it, what i was wanting to say was the difference between the high and the low shot and it does make a hell of a difference doesn't it yeah massive yeah <clears throat> massive nice to do. there you go they should ball to look at uh i mean more even things like um i don't know have a look at this one you see the the elevation it's a reflection, but the elevation is is crucial. If you're higher or lower, the position of that tree changes dramatically. Mm. Um, uh, uh, so yes, the difference UHS one, UHS two. So a UHS two card is faster. It's an extra layer of pins that allow more rapid communication between camera and card. Um, but not all cameras are UHS two capable. So if you haven't got a UHS two capable camera, then um, don't bother buying a UHS-2 card. The, the first slot on your camera is capable, Heather. Yeah. The second slot isn't. Isn't, no. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Because Claire mentioned that, didn't she? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I just wondered what the, what the difference, whether it was worth having uh, in the first slot uh, for doing pro <laughs> capture. Yeah, if you're yeah. doing 60 frames a second, because that's effectively video. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed there's a difference if you, you know, if I'm using the, the high speed um, on the camera, then because I was I was trying some, um, you know, dropping things into glasses and catching the splash and what have you, mm. then uh, with that... Um, high speed card it definitely makes a difference because it clears the buffer so quick yeah or perhaps i'll treat if i survive coronavirus i'll treat myself <laughs> <laughs> well, well you know you bought a drone and a lens in lockdown <laughs> survived so far so or i think drone. it seems like uh, you know it's a viable purchase right now you've survived yeah. up to now yeah, that's what I figure. Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. Any more um, questions? Nah, I think you've I think Dave, I think you've done a sterling job. Yes. Um absolutely. I think you've shown us some amazing photographs of real varied subjects and so there's some great stories in with it. But um also, just given us loads of tech, technical information and really emphasise the importance of understanding light, which is our raw material. So uh, I think we can all really thank you very much for a, a really great evening. Thank you. Thank you.
Absolutely. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You don't have to clap. I'm, I'm not the one in the NHS top. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's Alan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, right. So the only uh, other bit of this evening's business is the competition. So if Leslie wants to tell us uh, who the winners are. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. Right. Okay. Third, I've got Jeff with Scallop 2. Ooh. Ooh. Um, second, I've got Dave Hobbs with Sunset 1. And then first, I've got Chris with uh, the Scallop. Uh, you, I think you've called it Leslie 1, but it's the Scallop. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you all for doing it because they they look fantastic. I was really chuffed. Did you did you get some good ideas from it? Oh, definitely, yes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So that just falls to me to uh, pick a subject, doesn't it? Um, and I'm going to go with uh, the most important thing during lockdown, which is going to be. Alcohol. <laughs> it is. So that's your subject for next week. All right. Consumption of alcohol has gone up six hundred percent. In this in this room alone. Yes. <laughs> Cheers. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um and that's it for tonight. Chris. Yeah, I was Warren. Can I just yeah. say something about uh...